Hello everybody. Welcome to the Forest and Company webinar on Meeting of the Minds, how to make a great meeting. My name is Michael Clark. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Forest, and I will be your moderator today. With me is Tony Welsh, Forest EVP Consulting and Design. Welcome, Tony. Good afternoon. Firstly, for everyone, here's some housekeeping. This webinar will be 45 minutes long, including a few minutes for Q&A at the end. I have muted everyone's mic so that we're not talking over each other. Please hang on to your questions until the Q&A, but nevertheless, you can send them to me via the question dialog box in your GoToWebinar interface. Finally, to all registered attendees, I will forward to you a copy of uh, Tony's presentation and a YouTube link to the recording of the presentation as well. So it is with great pleasure, Tony, I pass the mic over to you. Okay, well, good afternoon. And uh, we thought we'd start off with uh, what appears to be a standard meeting here at Forrest & Company. Hey, Tony, what's this meeting about anyway? Uh, uh, didn't you get the agenda? I didn't see an agenda. Was Michael, there an agenda? Michael, uh, you were supposed to send the agenda out for this. Tony, Marsley, I, I thought you guys were going to do the agenda. Ah, oh. rats. Okay. Listen, an important issue has come up, and I think we should discuss it now. Okay, well, Angela, this is a sales meeting. Can we park it for later? Okay, sure. Okay. Hi, sorry I'm late, but uh, do I even have to be here for this meeting? Yeah, it's a, it's a sales meeting. And by the way, where's Mark? Well, Mark said there's no value in this meeting, so he's not going to attend. Ah! Okay, the meeting is canceled. Everybody Great. out, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Hopefully your meetings don't sound like that. Um, and look like this. Uh, so we are here today to talk about uh, what are the elements that can make meetings bad. And um, we're going to propose to you a four-step plan for preparing and, for, and, in fact, for conducting a meeting. Because meetings are usually 95% preparation, and the execution of them is relatively simple if you put the time in up front. We're also going to talk a little bit about the thinking styles and about the audiences that you can expect for various meetings. And then we'll take uh, questions and answers near the end. Tony, why don't we start uh, up with a poll about uh, how frustrated people can get with their meetings. Shall I throw that up? Sure. There you go. How often do your meetings frustrate you? I want you to get right now. OK, well, let's give it a few minutes, a few seconds rather, to see if we can tally up. And here we go, here we go, yes, and indeed, well, we're very lucky. We have 100% of attendees at this webinar are frustrated all the time oh. with uh, the progress of their meetings. So good, I'm glad we've got the right audience. We, we definitely do. Um, and it's, uh, it's standard with all of the organizations that we meet. One of the biggest complaints people have right after they don't understand what the priority for their work is is that they waste so much time in meetings that could have been productive doing other things. What I have here for you, did a bit of research in preparation for the website and, and pulled down some interesting statistics. Um, you can read down through, but engagement of 20, uh, is 20% 20 higher when the guests do most of the talking rather than the presenter. Now that really depends on the type of meeting that you have, but it can, it can relate to a training program or to a meeting itself where there's a presentation of information. 15-minute um, meetings are 50% more successful than 45-minute meetings. I found that astounding, but then I thought back over my, uh, my, my time and experience in the corporate world, and it's absolutely true. A 15-minute meeting is focused, it brings energy and attention to a specific topic, and rather than waiting for you know, the, the endless everyone have, have, having to say something, we can get to the point, make some decisions, or brainstorm, and then get on with the rest of our day. Um, another one that, uh, that this, uh, this individual uh, found when he was doing some research was that the longer the slide deck, the less likely, likely it was to be read when it's forwarded after the meeting. So usually, uh, in some cases, a team member will go and visit, uh, will attend a meeting on behalf of the team, and then they will say, yeah, I'll, I'll take the, the presentation, the material, and forward it to the rest of the team. Well, this rarely happens, it's been found, and if the deck is more than 40 slides, forget about the fact that even if it is forward, forwarded, the, uh, the likelihood of being read and understood is pretty low. So this speaks very much to 
good solid preparation and thinking about just the information that needs to get across and scoping the, uh, the material for the audience and how they, they plan to use it. And then finally, attendees may promise to forward material but only do it one out of seven times. Mm -hmm. So this can be two elements. Either they've come to the meeting and they promise to forward it to others, or as part of the meeting they, uh, they find that there's extra information that they could s distribute to people that were there, and, but only one out of seven times do they actually follow up. Very much this speaks to uh, the issue where you leave a meeting, you close your book, and, and essentially you do a brain dump and you forget why you're in the meeting and what the meeting was all about. Right. So some, just some interesting things as a background here to keep in mind as to why we need to tighten up the way we run more effective meetings. Um, another set of observations, these three fairly simple ones, but they combine a lot of ideas together. <clears throat> uh, this observer found that we don't clarify who needs to be here at meetings. And it, this we find to be um, relevant for most of the clients we have that have been you know, around and in business for a while, over time they will have a, um, a set of meetings that people attend or don't attend, and they get used to being there, whether or not their participation is relevant to the, the actual topic of the meeting. So some thought up front about who needs to be there is always going to be helpful for focusing and ensuring that the, the meeting is on track, on schedule, and gets the job done. The second one, we don't clarify what they need to, why they need to be here. So there's no expectation set either before or during the meeting as to what role each person that is going to be coming needs to play in order to be effective and moving the, the meeting process along rather than bogging it down. And then the last one, uh, which I think is, is absolutely crucial, is we don't clarify what's next. Um, we don't spend the time during a meeting uh, laying out what the next steps are, what people are accountable for, what decisions we've made and who's going to do, actually, you know, who's going to do what to who. Mm -hmm. We just assume that people in the meeting will take their, their feeling of responsibility and go ahead and, and just get stuff done. But in many cases that doesn't happen. We uh, leave one meeting and we go into the next one and the next one is now the most important thing on our minds. And then we move, we have an issue with a direct report, we've got some work we need to do with a team, all of the meeting, all of the, your memory of the earlier meetings just flushed unless at the end of the meeting there was a clear expectation set as to what to do. Right, the action item list. That's right, yeah, a hangar list, parking lot, or action items and specifying who's going to do, what are they going to do, and when can it be expected by the remainder of the team. Got it. Being very clear about that and then actually holding people's feet to the fire that, to do what they, what they promised to do. Uh, some other things. Now, this is a list that I generated of just general things that can get in the way. Uh, there, there appears to be no time to plan, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But the, the planning and preparation for a meeting is crucial to ensure that the meeting is going to be successful. As we say here, prior planning preparation can prevent piss-poor performance. I won't say that again, but um, if you spend the time up front, you're likely to have a very good meeting. There's no time to prepare, so the difference between planning and preparation, the plan is mentally going through and wargaming how you want the meeting to run, and it'll answer a bunch of questions for you about participation and about materials and all the rest of it. No time to prepare is, do you need to actually set the meeting up? Do you need to make sure that there's a flip chart there or an overhead? Um, are, have you got the materials on hand or distributed earlier for people to use during the meeting itself? Uh, next one, using the meeting time strictly for information updates. We'll talk about the three general kinds of meetings a bit later on, but we found that if a meeting is simply about passing information from one person to a team or from the team internally, there are so many other better, more cost-effective ways that actually um, appeal to different learning styles that can be used these days. Email, blog, uh, a, a conference call, all of those kinds of things that will not waste your time in meetings, which could be spent doing other, much more productive things. Outlook, my, the bane of my existence. Um, Outlook, the program, has uh, taken what used to be common sense and put it into uh, a formatted um, parade of activities through a day 
where you know even in high school we realized a long time ago that it takes 10 minutes to go from one place one class to another yet outlook will happily book back-to-back -back meetings in different sites on the location and not automatically build in the time to get there and much less the time to actually process what you just got out of the last mm -hmm. meeting and prepare yourself for the next. So one, one of the things we do here is we always uh, advise our, our, um, our clients when they're doing, if they're using Outlook or something similar to it, is always building in, never have a meeting longer than, than 45 minutes, keep it as short as you can, and always build in some processing time. What I refer to as some smoking time. If for those that have been in the workforce for a long time, you will remember in the 80s and the 70s that everyone, that a lot of people smoked, and what they did was they went out and they had a good solid five or 10 minutes to either socialize and get the inside scoop on what was happening elsewhere on the plant, or they had the 10 minutes to think about what they'd just done in the meeting, how it could have gone better, and also prepare themselves mentally for the next thing they're going to do. Outlook has taken that time seemingly away from us, and it's time for us to battle back and, and, own, her, and own it. Exactly. Um, anaclesis uh, is a term that we use. Uh, it means basically the requirement to lean on things. And in this case, uh, it, when you invite everyone, you're kind of covering your butt. But also it means that if you invite everyone, you don't have to have the conversation with the person that's not being invited, that usually has been invited, that sees it as being a status symbol for being invited, but you know through your planning really doesn't have need to be there or have a positive impact on the, on the meeting itself. So it's about the trap of always inviting the same people, whether they, they're needed or not. Following up in priorities, um, we tend to flip from the top burning email to the next burning email, and that tends to set the tone and the temper for our day, unless we have the rigor and the self-control to stay on track with our planned activities. It's difficult for many managers in this world to identify and discern the priorities of work. And usually we take first come, first serve. We're people of action, so we tend to gravitate towards that. So another difficulty can be how does the follow-up requirement of a meeting fit into the overall priorities of, of the individual or the team? And does it make sense and are, are they over-promising and under-delivering as far as the team, the, uh, the meeting uh, support goes? Failure to capture minutes. Um, we, have, we had a great example here in the office just recently where uh, we took three of our, our senior people offline for an hour and we did a brainstorming session. And then three months later, when we needed the results of that, we couldn't find the minutes anywhere. And it looks like we, they simply weren't taken. So we'd wasted all of the money of the salaries of that person and the, the rental of the space to do the brainstorming. Um, and we basically took that money and burned it. We threw it away. So failure to capture minutes, if a good idea comes up in a meeting and it's not captured, it's an absolute waste. So we uh, do... Uh, spend some time, and we will talk here, about the role of a note taker or recorder as an essential part of an effective meeting process. Poor context setting is another one, where people come into a meeting and they don't understand why they're there, or they don't understand the intention of the meeting. Uh, I, innumerable times I have been uh, halfway through a meeting when someone or me or you know the, the facilitator kind of put their hand up and say, what is the problem that we're trying to solve for here? Because it wasn't clear up front what the intention of the meeting was. If that is set clearly, then people know what to listen for and know the kinds of questions that, that they need to ask. And it can be a much more productive meeting with a very simple statement up front of, this is the context in which we're running this meeting. So we'll talk about that when we talk about the four Ps of running an effective meeting. Uh, straying off the path, there's always someone that's going to grab an idea and want to take it in that direction. They have some energy to pull it in that direction. It's up to the facilitator or the, the meeting leader to figure out whether or not that, it, that, uh, that movement is healthy towards the outline of the meeting and not let the, uh, the agenda for the meeting be hijacked by a special interest group or someone that has something great that they need to talk about. Or just the loudest person in the room. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, and, we'll, and, and the, whereas the quietest people usually have all the right answers. They're just <laughs> waiting for the opportunity to say something. Uh, confirming understanding. 
Um, the simple questioning technique that uh, everyone knows through whatever uh, training you've had is paraphrasing. Um, so someone is, if they're participating in a meeting, it's crucial that everyone understands what's being said. So it, it's, it could be the facilitator, the meeting leader, or someone else's role to paraphrase back what they just heard in order to confirm that everyone is on the same page and they're taking the same meaning from whatever the statement was. <clears throat> And then finally, the um, weak or late distribution of material. Either before the meeting or after the meeting, if promises were made that documents and information would be sent out, often we don't do that because we're, we're stuck in the priority and the gerbil wheel of getting to the next meeting. So making sure that you're building into your schedule the time to follow up from the meeting will ensure that you haven't wasted your time during that meeting. It's interesting, Tony, I'm reviewing this stuff with you, I'm, I'm beginning, the, the, there's an underlying message here that you should not think just about yourself and the meetings, just think organizationally. Think about, like, turn the people who are in the meeting into dollar signs and figure out how much this is really going to cost, relatively speaking, of course, so that you make sure that the meeting is success. Otherwise, like you said, you're burning money. Yeah, it, uh, more and more of our clients are going in that direction when they're, when they're uh, thinking about is it a one-day off-site or a two-day off-site, are we inviting three levels of management or four levels of management for whatever it happens to be, they're more than anything else, many of them are getting away from, well, culturally this would be a cool thing to do, or we did it last year, and they're turning more towards the metrics of how much money, what's the opportunity cost, cost. that we are wasting by pulling these people off the line. And if they're looking at it from that point of view, the meeting's better be pretty on, 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 on schedule yep, absolutely. and produce the effect that they need to. So uh, what I'm going to introduce you to here is a very simple um, meeting planning tool. And again, 95% of an effective meeting, in my mind, is the preparation that's done beforehand. So we really are talking about both the preparation and the execution of effective meetings. And here are the four. And they are in sequence, and they are in the order that I suggest you consider them. First of all is the purpose. What exactly do you need to get from the meeting? You start, if you start with the end in mind, what the end of the meeting needs to look like, it allows you to build back through the actual meeting itself and build back through the preparation and the people that need to be there. If you're going from the start point where the meeting's starting, it's much more difficult to plan for the effect that you need to get at the end. So we always say uh, prepare the future. So what is the purpose? Articulating the purpose is important. Once you've done that, you can figure out who needs to attend and you can, you can speak to why and you can think about the preparation that you might ask each one of these people to do either as part of the meeting or prior to or after the meeting. Process, what type of meeting? We'll talk about different types of meetings. So if you know where you need to get to, there are many different mechanisms within a meeting to actually get there. It could be the medium that you use, such as webinar or blog, or does it need to be face-to-face, -face, or is a telephone conference going to work? Um, or uh, during the meeting itself, do we need to use different types of thinking and different types of activity to engage the group effectively? And then the preparation. Um, once you've got all the other three answered, the preparation is the wrap-up of all three of those. So uh, what needs to be ready for the meeting and how should others prepare is a great way of capping it off and being able to set your plan. This is kind of what, this is where you shape the agenda primarily and you're able to send it out to people and you've got a really good idea of um, what you need everyone to do, where they need to do it, et cetera, et cetera. So I find this a, a really cool yet simple four-stage planning process for effective meetings. Uh, so let's first of all talk about the planning tool. Now I borrowed this from a, uh, a fellow that we've done work with here at Forrest and Company, and I'm a, quite a fan of his. Bill Jensen uh, wrote a book quite a while ago entitled Simplicity. His view on, uh, on corporate communications is that whether you're communicating or you're planning to communicate or you're planning just about anything in an organization, there are five things that a, the person that's planning it needs to be able to articulate clearly in order to uh, understand the context and, and just get it right, right off the bat. 
these are the five steps that he, he talks about. And in fact, I use them as a training design platform. When I'm speaking to someone new about something exciting that they want to do, I ask each one of these questions and it gives me a very good idea of, you know, what exactly they're looking for so that they and I are sharing the same view of the end result of the, the event, whatever it happens to be. So first of all, no. These are questions you ask yourself and you jot down the answers because they will roll up into the, the remaining planning for the session. What exactly do you want people to know by the end of the meeting? What knowledge do they need to have? What information do they need to have? The second one is feel. How do you want them to feel as the meeting wraps up? Do you want them to feel excited? Do you want them to feel nervous? Do you want them to feel confident going forward? This very much will dictate the tone and perhaps the location and perhaps the timing of the meeting that you're going to run. Um, this is probably the hardest one to identify. So at the end of a meeting, if I want people to realize that what we're just going, what we're talking about is going to be their highest priority and it might require them to change in the future, then I'm going to design the session differently than just be informed because another team is working on this. So the feel is very important. Although the, the knowledge piece, the know, might be exactly the same. <laughs> do. Is there anything you want them to be able to do as a result of the meeting? So is there a knowledge or a skill transfer um, or information transfer that by the end of the meeting they can do something that they could not do at the beginning of the meeting? Or is there anything that you want them to be able to do during the meeting itself? Hmm. Uh, either one of those two questions will again lead you towards the design of the session itself and will drive your preparation for the meeting. Use is the next one. Is there something that attendees should be able to use after the meeting? Are there tools? Are there resources? Are there people? Are there training courses? Are there websites that you'd like them to be able to use to do the things you're asking them to do as part of the meeting? And then finally, succeed. This is an overall one or two simple uh, sentence, you know, a simple statement if this meeting is successful, this is what it will look like. Um, and, and it kind of wraps up the other four. It, it wraps them all together. But again, it speaks only to the end state of the meeting, the last minute of the meeting, what needs to be in place in order for that to be deemed a success. So once again, the tool is no, feel, do, you succeed. And in that order, you'll find that you have a very good idea of the purpose of the meeting that you're planning. And for the very first time, I think, in forest history, we haven't turned that into an acronym. We, we really tried, but it was kind of rude when we came up with it, so we decided to, no, that wouldn't work. But we do have t-shirts and coffee mugs available. <laughs> Go online. People. Now, the people part, we've talked about enough, enough about that, about the anaclesis of always inviting the right people, the status involved with going to meetings or not being clear on what people's roles are and why they should be there. If you've gone through the no field do you succeed, you now should have a pretty good idea of the resources, i.e. the people that you need in that meeting. So, uh, and a lot of people will go to meetings and they have no idea why they're there. I hear this as a constant refrain, especially at the director vice president level, where people are being, when those people are being invited in, for information purposes or so that the presenter of the meeting can know that their boss is listening to them talk Interesting. or provide top cover. So if there's a politics that's involved in who comes. But at the end of the day, you're sitting there saying, there was no reason I needed to be there. Um, once you've defined the purpose, which is the first step, you invite only those people that need to attend and you should be able to identify roles for them to perform. And we'll talk about what, what those roles are. So the roles in meetings. There are four. Um, there can be more. It depends on the complexity and the type of role uh, meeting that you're running. It can be less if it's a very simple meeting. There needs to be a facilitator. Now, in many cases, when a manager is meeting with their team, the facilitator will be the manager. Fair enough. Um, in, in larger organizations that we've worked with, I've seen on many occasions where they have a facilitator bureau of uh, people that are interested in, in helping run meetings and they get some outside training on how to be a facilitator and their role then is to bop into any team that is having a meeting that, with, that has heavy process. The facilitator strictly runs the process and the, the manager of the team or the accountable executive within the team 
runs the uh, you know runs the knowledge, the content, the content. So the facilitator doesn't need to know anything about what the, the team's talking about, but they need to be clear on the outcome and hence the process that is going to lead to the outcome and guide the team towards it. So there's always a constant tension. If I'm, if I'm managing the meeting, should I be the facilitator, should I be the, the manager and therefore a participant, can I be both? And usually it's not an issue as long as you identify beforehand to the team. I'm going to be running the process, but I also have an opinion, so I'm going to jump, jump in occasionally and, and say what I'm going to say. The timekeeper. Um, when you issue an agenda for meeting, we'll talk about agendas a little bit later on, um, the timekeeper can be crucial for making sure that the meeting feels like it's actually a good meeting. There's um, some of the best managers I've ever worked with um, are known for their succinct on-time meetings where they start on time, they finish on time, and they accomplish more or less all the time all of their, their intended output for the meeting. And if they don't, there's been a good reason for it and they've informed everyone that we're going off track because I see the value. A timekeeper is a person that is part of the meeting, but they look at their watch occasionally and they give warnings like if we continue talking about this much longer, we might not get to the end mm -hmm. or we've got two more minutes to brainstorm before we move to the next segment. Very simple role, but it's one that makes the meeting feel really high powered, really focused, like there's a professionalism there. The recorder captures all the wonderful ideas and decisions. Now whether this is um, putting a, uh, a voice recorder in the middle of the meeting, which isn't a bad idea if we're doing something legal, something where there's a lot of information being flown, thrown around, and then minutes are generated from that. It could be some, someone writing verbatim the, uh, you know, the, the minutes as the, the meeting goes through, or it could be someone just capturing the high-level um, notions that are floated during the meeting. But all this to say that um, if you leave it to everyone to take notes, you're going to get, if there are 15 people in the meeting, you're going to get 15 versions of what's important. Interesting, yes. Uh, one of the things we like to do, depending on the style and the content of the, of the meeting, is to have the recorder take the records on a flip chart. That way if someone says something, they see the recorder writing it out, they can say, no, that's not exactly what I was thinking about. It's more like this. It's bigger, it's smaller, it was black, it was yellow. Um, and also by having them visually up there, it can spur other ideas from other participants, where if you're writing it, it you're not sure what's being written. And then finally, the participants, you know, the, the other people in the meeting. Um, they need to be actively participating, and that should be up to the facilitator to encourage an environment where they can participate appropriately and not take the meeting off track. So, Tony, tell me about, because we've got these four roles, um, and I suppose many people in the audience um, work in a facility where they can divide it up, but, but let's face it, a lot of our listeners are, are probably mid-level managers who are talking to their teams in a meeting where they have to be the facilitator, the timekeeper, the recorder, and the participant. Is, is, is it just a matter of being conscious of that and, and announcing to, to, the, to the attendees at the meeting? Yeah, I think that, that works. Um, it's difficult, and especially if you are in a process-heavy meeting where there's a series of gateways and decisions that you have to make along the way and you are under a time crunch, usually the worst combination is facilitator-recorder. Hmm because the facilitator needs to be thinking about what's next and did we, did we accomplish what we needed to in that segment and just what's the next thing I need to do. They also need to be listening clearly for understanding and for any objections that might be coming up around the table. If they are at the same time recording, they're going to lose that, that ability to stay up and stay ahead. Right. So that's usually where people get lost entirely. And in fact, they probably they usually do a worse job of recording. So although they might be running an efficient meeting, the records at the end will not seem that way, and the meeting will have been a waste of time. Right. Okay. But it depends. If it's a very simple meeting, certainly they can do all, all four of the roles. Good question. Um, so the facilitator, we've talked a bit about it, maybe you or maybe someone else. There's, as, a team, uh, as a team building activity, it's not a bad idea if you, if you have many team meetings to alternate who the facilitator is going to be. If you're the manager of a team that meets, ask one of your direct reports to run the next meeting 
make sure they're supported and they don't feel too nervous about it, but you should have behaviorally modeled what you think is a good meeting a couple of times beforehand. It gives them a chance to shine, and it's a, it's a great skill build for them because you're positioning them to be more effective in the future. And then kind of rotate it around through the team and make sure everyone's got a crack at it. Interesting. You can ask for volunteers, or it might be you running the meeting yourself all the time, and that's acceptable as well. Um, and we talked about the participation versus process. If there's a conflict in the meeting, it's usually very important for the facilitator to identify upfront whether or not they are going to participate as in the meeting from you know a participation point of view, or if they're simply there to run the uh, run the agenda. Um, people don't like when they're not sure what people's personal agendas are in the meeting, especially if there's strong beliefs and values or, you know, some differing opinions on the table. You don't want someone just popping in with with an opinion and then dropping out and saying, "But I'm the facilitator, so you've got to listen to me." Right? <laughs> it, it doesn't engender trust. The facilitator must be prepared. Got to have the information uh, based on your no feel do you succeed. You should have a good idea of what that is. Um, you must have a clear idea of what the end of the meeting needs to look like and what the follow-up procedure is because that will affect the way you facilitate the meeting to get to uh, ensuring that you've got the follow-up clear with the participants of the meeting. And then finally, it's always a great idea to prepare some questions. Um, there, there's uh, basically two types of questions, open-ended and closed-ended. Open-ended questions. Uh, engender creativity, exploration. It is divergent thinking on the part of the team. Um, Closed-ended questions, yes or no, allow you to get away from that brainstorming and get towards a decision. So it's, it's convergent thinking. So thinking about the type of questions you want to use at the right time, having them seated. So if you get lost in the process, you've got some open-ended questions where you can test for understanding and also, frankly, buy yourself a bit of time to get back on process. Got it. Yeah. So some good ideas there. The timekeeper, I think, enough said. It's about following the agenda and just letting the facilitator know where the process stands. The recorder. Um, the recorder can be straight. We've talked about a, a number of ways of doing this. Um, you really should, the recorders, uh, the, the method the recorder used should reflect the type of meeting that this is. One of the least used ones I find is something called a mind map, which I have a, a, a graphical example of down the bottom here. Um, mind map is a series of connected ideas that as they're being, and this is primarily used when you're brainstorming an idea. You can see the example on the bottom. If the topic is months of the year, well, we could break it down into the four seasons that we know, spring, summer, autumn, and, and winter. And then we can break it out even further and say, so what are the months? Well, we attach the months to the outside of that. It's a very simple one. <clears throat> this can be used for just about anything. Uh, the, the idea is when you're brainstorming, you're filling up the spider web of connected ideas. And in fact, it's going to look a lot more messy than when you're uh, generating information about the ideas, you can add the information to each one of them. You can say, for example, uh, that March has 31 days and you know information like that. And then if when you're making a decision about which date you're going to do something on, you can go through and cross off those ones that don't have enough information or are not the appropriate decision. Oh, interesting. So for me, as, as being a kind of a creative thinker, I, I love the visuality of it. Uh, and it, it also allows everyone to look at it and say, that's what I said, that's what I meant, without having to arduously write every single word that people are talking about. That's one way. And again, putting it on a flip chart where it's visible so people can check for understanding, that's cool. It can be anything else, straight minutes, whatever. But it needs, but the method selected by the recorder needs to reflect the emphasis and the purpose of the meeting. It needs to be appropriate. Tony, what about what would be the downside of actually literally recording, like getting a microphone in and recording the meeting? Um, there, there are some. There are some people that are reticent to talk in a meeting where their voice is being recorded. Point. Um, it's difficult unless you're very adept at it to. Uh, remember and find a way of logging who was making the comment because you might not be able to discern it from the voice point of view. 
Um, other than that, it, it really it, it does lend itself to certain kinds of meetings where you're talking about amount, vast amounts of detail or it's critical in a negotiation, for example, where you get the exact wording of an agreement. So it, it does have pros and cons. Yeah, and, and if it's not transcribed, no one's ever going to listen no to it. No one's ever going to listen to it. We have, how many recordings do we have around here? Oh, stop. Brilliant moments in time when uh, no one's actually gone back and listened to them, and then they find it two years later and say, this is gold, if only someone had written it out. And then the participant's point of view, it's up to them to bring their best game. If they're there as a participant, the expectation is that they're going to earn their money's worth uh, of their salary for that hour or three hours or 45 minutes by participating actively, supporting the, the, role, the role within the meeting, and helping the facilitator get to the point that has been decided on that the meeting needs to, you know, needs to finish on. And if they don't, they shouldn't be there. So the three kinds of meetings. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly about these. This is a general, a, a vast generalization, but we find it handy um, to, uh, to describe them. What I've done here is I very sneakily stuck in a color coding system that I plan to, I'll, I'll expand on a little bit as we go through. The generally the three kinds of ideas, the first is idea, ideation or generation or brainstorming. This is a type of meeting where, that, um, where it's about generating ideas, including everyone in, not saying no to things, you know, just brainstorming and seeing if you can actually challenge the status quo. I say affinity here because affinity charting is, is an actual tool or mechanism that you can use to brainstorm quickly a bunch of ideas and get them organized. Um, so that's one, that's one type of meeting. The second type of meeting is where information is being passed. And we talked about the danger of having just information meetings only. There's many other ways to do it, and a lot of people don't learn or retain information well just from hearing it at a meeting. So there might be other avenues and opportunities. But this is where it's about details, lists, plans that have already been placed, updates. Now, to a certain extent, coordination. But coordination, in this case, is where no decisions need to be made. It's just about inf information passage. And the, fi the final uh, type of meeting, decisions, where um, you might have generated some ideas, there might be some information available, but the intention of the meeting, at the end of this meeting, we will be successful if we have made a plan, we've made a decision, we've confirmed a plan, we've coordinated, and actually actions arose out of that. We've decided to act or to not act on a specific topic. Most meetings actually have elements of all three of these. So you'll start with a bit of a brainstorm, you'll collect information about the brainstorm, and then you'll make decisions based on the brainstorm. Or there could be different components where one is about a brainstorm, it's disconnected from the next piece, which is an update on a project, which is disconnected from something else about making a decision on a completely different topic. You know, what I'd like to add, Tony, is that um, what we teach at Forest is actually at the top level, these three things, these three concepts, these three types of meetings represent the totality of human thought, that everything we do is either a green, a red, or a blue thought. And so uh, although there's, there's combinations of them at another level, but if you approach meetings with this categorization, you're pretty much covering off every single type of thinking that could possibly happen. Yeah, you are. If you selected them appropriately at the right time for the right intent, you're, um, not only are you uh, using the, the three different parts of the brain, if you will, right. you're activating them appropriately, but you're going to find people come into meetings in different, with different needs. And if you're using all three of these, the person that needs to generate ideas will be satisfied. The person that won't go to bed unless they get that last piece of detail will be satisfied. And the person that's ready to move to action on this item will be satisfied as well. Or I think we have a poll on this. Uh, you're right, too, indeed. So let's see now. Our second poll of the webinar. And let me just launch it. What type of meeting do you most often attend? So think about, uh, think about the meetings. Let's just go back a couple of weeks. And what are they? Are they idea-generating meetings, information meetings, or decision meetings? And we're using the code of green, red, and blue here. And then we're, we're talking about the primary intent of a meeting. E every meeting is going to have small elements of all of these, but it's the primary overall intent. 
And once again, we've got a 100% response rate here, and 100% is information. So everybody in this meeting, everybody in our webinar today is is uh, going to information dumps. <laughs> well, then I, I think I think we've uncovered a vast opportunity for the people that are listening to uh, to this webinar. Uh, just think about the amount of time that you could save by finding different ways of spending of spreading information and how you can truly leverage the power of awesome meetings by thinking about the inclusion of decisions and ideas. So, well done. Uh, focus on different process meetings, different types of meetings. So, the meeting focus, there's 101 different types of meetings. I, I've just listed a couple here because each one of these, the, the type of meeting should be driven by the purpose of the meeting rather than we always do it so we've done it. Standing meetings are, you know, the, the team meets every Tuesday morning from 9 till 10. It's, it's a, a standard practice. Scrums or huddles being uh, often used in project work or when the pressure is really tight, people come together very quickly, talk about the next steps that they need to do for a, um, a product development. They go back, they, they enact that work, they come back, they huddle up again, they talk about where they are, the issues they have. Uh, project meetings, updates or decision meetings within projects, strategic operational or tactical planning, team building meetings, introductory meetings, client meetings, I mean, there's all kinds of meetings. These should be driven, this, your selection of, the, of the, the focus of the meeting should be driven by the purpose that you discern by going through no feel, do you succeed. Just realizing that there are many different ways of expressing meeting time together. Uh, now, on to the, the preparation, the dreaded agenda. Everyone knows, I'm, I'm wagging my finger, everyone knows that in order to run a good meeting, you've got to have an agenda, and it has to be out beforehand, and it has to have good detail, and it's got to have time on it. Um, now, everyone knows that, and few people have the time to do it. So I just want to give you some ideas about maybe sh ways to shortcut some of this, but also some things you might consider adding to an agenda so that the agenda is much more effective in driving a very cool meeting. First of all, they should be uh, circulated beforehand. By doing that, you're allowing those people that are participants or recorders or um, uh, facilitators or timers to understand what's going to be expected of, in the, of them in the meeting. In fact, many of our clients now use that green, red, blue numbering, uh, coloring um, system that we introduced you to earlier to actually use that on the agenda and say, this is a green element. We're going to be brainstorming. Uh, activities for bring your kids to work day, for example. Um, we're going to be passing on information about the new policy about parking around the building, and we're going to make decisions on what our new colored, uh, what type of new uh, sweatshirts we're going to buy for the uh, the employee store. You know, just some examples like that. Um, start by setting context for the meeting. This is something that, that we we push hard. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's very, um, we're talking about this very specifically where the, the facilitator of a meeting, one of the first things they say is, allow me to set context for this meeting, and they actually say that. And what they do is they talk about the circumstances that have caused this meeting to be called. So I'm going to set context. The reason why we're meeting today is because uh, there are a lot of crummy meetings being run in business within Canada. So that's kind of the, that's the context. That's what's happening and that's why we're having the meeting. This meeting is important because we're going to talk about ways of, of scoping meetings so that they can be more effective and actually not waste time. We then also suggest that people describe the purpose of the meeting. So, and, and the purpose is different than the context. The context is the world within this is going to happen. The purpose very simply talks to what I intend to do, what we need to intend to do during this meeting. So if the context was there's a lot of crappy meetings being run, the purpose here is not to run a good meeting. It's not to train timekeepers for running a meeting. It is to inform people of the methods to better facilitate effective meetings over time. And by understanding that purpose, you'll be listening for those elements throughout the meeting. You'll be better prepared with questions, and you'll be asking better questions as time, time goes along. 
The last thing you want to think about, especially with a team that doesn't get together often, or if they have and they've had conflict in the past, is right up front setting up some ground rules. We talked about some of those earlier. If the facilitator plans to facilitate and also participate, they should say that beforehand. If there's an expectation about questions, please leave questions to the end of my presentation or ask questions at any point that you wish. Expectations for follow-up. At the end of this meeting, be aware that all of you will have some homework to do. Is very uh, is a real attention getter and will change the emphasis of the participation, the participant's role in the meeting. And if you have a team that you know gets into falls into the odd fisticuffs every now and then, um, if there are disagreements during the meeting, how will we handle them? I will arbitrate it. We'll take a break. You know, whatever the rules are that you feel need to be in place, setting them up up front will feel like you're not arbitrarily setting them up as you go along. Interesting. Although if you, if you talk too much about the ground rules, you can set an expectation that this is going to be a really overly controlled meeting. So there's some judgment and discretion used here as to how much direction you'll give before. And a good manager is setting the ground rules for behavior and the team as a whole, perhaps that can just transfer into into the meeting itself. Absolutely, and usually this is where teams are built. Mm-hmm. They're not out doing you know, trust falls and, and singing kumbaya to build meetings, to build teams. They're, they're running effective meetings and, and linking in and getting to know each other. So this is the mechanism for that. <laughs> so the manager should have a huge effect on the behaviors within the meeting. Um, and a couple more things about the dreaded agenda. Uh, items, to, then you've got to list the items. Okay, so refer back to the no feel, do, you succeed, and you should be able to get information about the pacing <clears throat> and also the time allocation. You might find that you're spending a lot of time on something that at the end of the meeting is not that important, and you, you can go back and reallocate the time, so it's appropriate to the emphasis and the importance of that element of the meeting. So spending 25 minutes updating people on something and then spending five minutes on a decision at the end, but actually the meeting is about the decision. You might want to reallocate and reapportion. So it doesn't feel like the most important part is being jammed in right at the end, which will cause concern amongst the people that need a bit more time on it. Um, Indicate in the agenda the type of thinking. I've talked about that already, and you might actually simply teach your team the, the three colors that we've talked about here. It's very simple brainstorming or thinking about the future, information, talking about now, or decisions, what are we going to do? Based on the past, our past experience, what are we going to do differently going ahead? And, and my last uh, piece of advice is any agenda is better than no agenda. If you don't have the time, get out what you possibly can. Something that in the military they, they refer to as a warning order. Um, if they don't have a full plan set, but Someone, you're going to be doing something soon, helps at least for my time management and me setting priorities. Much better than surprise, yeah. come to a meeting. You know, it, it's on now. Um, the meeting diamond. This is a, a good visual that I like to, uh, to use with um, facilitators that really want to hone their skills. What this talks to, the, uh, the vertical line is, is time. So from the top of the diamond is when the meeting starts, and the bottom of the diamond is where the meeting ends. Have you been in meetings where they just go on and on and on and on? And usually that's because there's a preference in the room for red, for information, and there's never too much information for some people. So what this is is kind of a heads-up visual, uh, you know, something that the, the uh, facilitator can keep in their mind are we spending enough time generating ideas? And if we don't, that means we are relegated to always doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different result. We all know what that's a definition of. Once we've generated some ideas, we get into information. So if that was a good idea, how much would it cost? Is it appropriate? Is it the right thing to do? Or is it you know, what we want? But there, there's a question that, the, that all facilitators need to ask. And that's what's represented on the left-hand side here by the crucial term, when do we have enough information so we can move towards a decision? This will stop run-on meetings. This will stop meetings that go over time or simply run out of of time and have to be rescheduled for three months later 
once everyone's forgotten about the initial meeting and you've wasted all of that time. So when do we have enough information to comfortably start to you know, converge our thinking and come towards a decision and make a commitment? It's a very simple graphic, but in my mind it's one that all facilitators should keep in mind as far as that, that feel, that discretion of when is it time to turn off and move in a different track and perhaps use a different tool from your toolkit to get the team there. Um, and then let's just talk quickly about the audience. Um, we talked about the color coding system and, and now I'm just going to give you a little bit more differentiation on that. No matter how you are thinking about the meeting, the likelihood is if you've got 10 or more people in the meeting, they're going to be bringing in different mindsets, different uh, information requirements, different activity requirements. And by understanding what those are, you can better uh, align the agenda so that you're actually satisfying all of the requirements of the people that are showing up. So let's start with um, imagination. Some people will come in and they, they want to break the paradigms of whatever the topic is and think out into the future and think about very different ways of doing things. So if you li allow some time for that, you might get that breakthrough, that step change idea that all companies are looking for in, in various elements of, of their business. You might also find people under expressiveness that are thinking about how the results of this meeting are going to play with other people. Is the tone right? Is the messaging right? Does it fit the culture? Does it feel comfortable? Curiosity. Those people that not, don't necessarily need to be broken right out of, you know, out of the box, but within the box, how can we improve things? What's the challenge? What's the next little steps we can take to move this issue ahead or get this thing to market? There are going to be people, especially if they have a real vested interest in the topic of the meeting, will come in with opinions, and they've decided already that the old way was the right way to do it, and you've really got to convince me before I'm going to get on track with this new way of doing it or they have strong beliefs. They're, they see their world changing as a result of the meeting and they're going to hold on to, you know, through anaclesis, they're going to hold on to that old thing that they know to be true. Or they feel threatened somehow. Opinions will, will uh, be there, so finding a way to uh, air those and bring them out so everyone can make the, see them and make them visible and talk about them is a real facilitation trick. It's interesting if you're, if you're a, a manager as well as the facilitator, you have to be prepared that your team can bring all of these elements and be ready to deal with it. Yeah. Uh, you just can't put your head in the sand, right? If, if you've got people on your team who come with very strong opinions on something, uh, I don't want to do it that way, uh, we've always done it this way, um, this is really important to me, you'd be prepared to deal with that and accept it. That's, it's great. People like that tend to go to action quickly. They, there are positives and negatives on all sides of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and they're, um, so if you had a strong issue like that, you'd probably derail it before the meeting. But um, it's about just realizing that you might be coming in, okay, this is you know, in, in uh, knowledge. I want to pass a bunch of information onto my team. But what everyone else is uh, coming in with is they already have drawn an opinion and they're going to challenge the information that you're passing. So just realizing that there's six different ways that people can show up and allowing for them is, will mean you're almost never caught flat-footed. Right. Uh, the knowledge piece is about they're, they're coming in and they want the details, the facts, the figures. They want the Excel spreadsheets with the pivot tables. There's never too much information, so let's keep talking about it. These are the people that can cause a meeting to expand forever because they're never, there's never enough information for them to feel comfortable to say, okay, now I can make a decision because we have it all. And then lastly, the, uh, the sound argument, there are those people that will be comparing things side by side and trying to find the argument for why one thing is better than another, the, you know, the, the cold logic. So be prepared that there might be some people looking for that and if you could provide that to them, as the facilitator or another participant in the meeting, you will satisfy that requirement and get them on side much more quickly. So those are the six. If you keep those in mind, you're never going to be caught, I don't think. Um, and a tool, a very simple tool, that I, Michael, are we going to be distributing this after the webinar? Absolutely, yes we are. Okay, something we call the Thinking Quick Check Scorecard. The, uh, the six questions in color on this chart 
represent the six different types of thinking that we just talked about earlier on the last slide. What we tend to do is at the end of a meeting, and our clients are using this all over the place, is as a, a continuous improvement activity, they'll send this out in the form of a, an email or however they do it or on paper, and just say, with regard to that meeting we just came out of, in your view, did you get enough ingenious thinking? And there's a description. So in genius thinking, did we generate a wide variety of ideas and options? Did we do too much of that? Was there enough of that or was there not enough of that? And so on for the other five questions. This should come back to the facilitator. It's continuous improvement for the facilitator's skill. It, it allows him, him or her to have more knowledge about the expectations of that team. And just in general, it, it's a way of improving future agendas and future preparation, the four Ps, for running a good meeting. It, it's a great loop back. And it, it's, not, you know, it's not an attack. It's just, in your opinion, was there too much or not enough? And you can always go to someone and say, why did you think it was too much? I thought it was appropriate. It's a great conversation to have. Because what all of this is about is setting managers up to be that one manager that everyone remembers throughout their career, that was the person that had the most interactive, engaging, exciting meetings where we actually got stuff done. That's what this is about. It's not just about being efficient. It's about being outstanding as a manager and a leader. And then finally, the, in closing, the, uh, the last comments I, I really have, this is about the conduct of the meeting. At the end of the meeting, this is where most meetings can go off track. Everyone closes their books and said, yep, okay. And everyone leaves with a completely different understanding of what's been decided. <clears throat> so a facilitator trick is, first of all, getting everyone to say back what they understand they need to do or what they understand has been decided in their own words. They will paraphrase it. You can listen and see whether or not they got it. And if they haven't got it, you can correct it now, rather than them saying, well, I thought they were doing that. And then the last one is to check for commitment to action. Not only do I understand what the meeting was about and what I need to do, but I am committed to getting it done. So writing out on a flip chart, I find very handy. Who is accountable for exactly what? and when can the team expect it to be done, and post that someplace. Either email it around to remind everyone or stick it up on the wall of your, your office. And when it gets done, take, you know, with a bit of lavish, check it off and sort of celebrate the fact that it's been done. This way people know exactly what's there. You're, you're allowing them to win by doing the things that will you know, cause this meeting to have been one of the better meetings of the month. And that ladies, gentlemen, and Michael, hey, is the last thing I have to say about running efficient meetings. Thank you very much, Tony. We're going into Q&A now. Um, I, I, I have to uh, ask, uh, thank everyone for sticking around. We have run a few minutes over, but I think uh, the information we're, 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 we were reviewing is, is positive enough to warrant that. Um, we've got lots of questions, and I want to tell you all, guarantee you that uh, either Tony or myself will get back to you with answers, but there's just one big question here that is actually repeated by, from several different people. So Tony, brace yourself. Uh, I'm facilitating a meeting and there is a participant who refuses to participate, contradicting everything and uh, sometimes even leaving in a huff. Uh, so that sounds like a, a more or less regular meeting with a regular attendance by a particular person. How do you deal with it? Well, um, you kick them. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, if, if you have a, a managerial relationship with them, if they're a member of your team, we feel that you're accountable for the working behaviors of your team. So if a team member is showing up like that, it could be that they really don't understand why they're there or what their role needs to be. It could also be that they don't understand what, good, what a good participant looks like. So I would suggest that that is not something they would handle it necessarily in a meeting, but if it's an ongoing behavioral issue, is you pull them off the side and you do a bit of coaching around it. They might not be aware that that's the way they're showing up. Um, they, they might well be, and in, I'd suggest 60% of the time will be shocked that they're being perceived that way. Interesting. So their intention is not the perception of others. Um, if, they do, if they are um, derailing a meeting, then ask yourself, first of all, do they really need to be there? And the rest of it, I think, is around performance management at the, at the end of the rainbow, but some good solid coaching in the middle to make sure they're aware of their, the impact they're having on the team and 
but at the end of the day, if you're the manager, you're accountable for the output of your team. If you're facilitating a meeting, you're accountable for the process and to get where it needs to get to. And you have to take away any of the interferences to allow that to, to be realized. It, it, it's up to you. Unfortunately, lots of managers don't have the, uh, the, the drive to do that. And they will allow that behavior to go on, and it becomes endemic. Um, so it, it, handle it as quickly as you can, because everyone else in the room is hoping that you will. Yeah, good point. Well, thank you very, very much, Tony. Um, I'm going to run out and uh, I'm going to run out and make a meeting. Um, but first of all, first of course, I'll do the no feel used, do succeed mantra. And thank all of you, especially since we did go a few minutes over. Uh, thank you all to our attendees. You've been listening to Tony Welsh talk to us today about a meeting of the minds, how to make a great meeting. This has been a Forest and Company webinar, part of our growing resource list of uh, webinars and uh, newsletters from the through the Forest Fire uh, approach, our Forest Fires Communications Group. To sign up for the group, uh, visit www.forestandco.com. That's F O R R E S T A N D C O dot com, and click on the communications group button. Registration is free, and of course, you can unsubscribe at any time. But it's certainly our job to make sure that you don't uh, you don't want to. So with that, I wish everyone uh, a great meeting. I hope you have a good meeting today and a great rest of day. Thank you very much. <laughs>